Good afternoon. Um, thank you for staying until the last session. Thank you also for the kind invitation to this great meeting. My name is Melanie Ott. I'm a virologist from the Gladstone Institute at UCSF in San Francisco. I'm interested in many viruses, um, including SARS-CoV-2 since um, January of this year. And I would like to share with you our newest results on, on diagnostic directions um, with um, SARS-CoV-2. Now we all know that now six months or more into the pandemic, we're still left with the same tools um, that we had at the beginning in the absence of a functioning vaccine and in the absence of available therapeutics. Um, we are left with masking, social distancing, and testings. But in, in order for the tests to be really efficient in breaking the pandemic, they have to be frequent, they have to be fast, they have to be everywhere, and they have to be focused on the detection of spreaders. So Michael Mina uh, from Harvard recently published a model where he showed that if we were testing daily, everybody, um, our total infection rate would be down to zero. However, this only works if we have a fast turnaround um, of, zero, of zero days. Um, if we wait one or two days as the current turnaround for the PCR essays are, infection rates start to creep up. And if we, were, if we would be testing every three days and get the result um, after two days, we would already have a 50% uh, infection rate. So frequent and fast turnaround testing is really critical. Um, our testing is, um, is, our testing strategy that I'm going to describe to you is targeted towards the um, viral RNA. We all know that there's a complex situation of viral RNAs when, when in, in coronaviruses. We have the full length, long viral RNA that is indicating infectious virions, but there's also a subset of very highly expressed but non-infectious um, subgenomic RNAs um, that can con confound the, um, the result. So an important um, essay that needs to be developed but has, has not yet occurred is to differentiate between the infectious and the non-infectious, sometimes lingering RNAs um, in the sample. For now, a good indication is potentially viral load. We know from several studies that a viral load below a million per milliliter, million copies per milliliter usually does not yield infectious particles. Um, so that is a, a tool to break the pandemic, could be really a test that's rapid with immediate results, must be applied multiple times per week, should have a sensitivity in the range of a thousand copies per microliter, which is a million copies per ml. And again, the goal here is really stopping transmission and not really um, a clinical diagnosis. So we have been thinking about um, this type of test since about two years. Um, I have been thinking about this with my colleague Jennifer Doudner, of course, pioneer in the CRISPR technology, and Dan Fletcher, a bioengineer from UC Berkeley. Both also have an, an affiliation with the Gladstone Institute. And Dan has really done very important work in um, using mobile phones for um, um, diagnostics. We thought about this um, developing a, a home test for HIV uh, in order to allow patients to get off antiretroviral therapy and monitor conveniently their viral loads um, at, from home. And we did this by combining really the advances um, that Jennifer is bringing to CRISPR technology with the mobile phone technology that, um, that Dan has been developing. So first, the CRISPR essay. We're focusing on an enzyme called Cas13A, which is a RNA-binding CRISPR enzyme that combined with a guide RNA, a little snippet that corresponds to the viral RNA, forms a complex called RNP, ribonucleoprotein complex, that when finding its target RNA, in this case the viral RNA, um, gets activated, becomes a nuclease, and cleaves um, RNAs, in it, RNAs in its environment, including um, potentially an RNA reporter that carries a quencher and a fluorophore on each of its sides. So when that reporter is cleaved proportionally to the amount of the viral target in the, in the, in the sample, 
it elicits um, fluorescence that can be conveniently over time measured in a plate reader in the lab. And that's happened 2016 when Jennifer first described this um, reaction. However, when she did this, she also reported that the LOD or the limit of detection was rather poor and, and was in the range of 100,000 per, um, per microliter and not close to a range which would be suitable for a viral diagnostic. So that's why 2017, um, the Sherlock essay was um, you know, developed by the group of Fang Zheng at the Broad Institute, where they cleverly combined um, you know, the um, CAS-13 essay with a pre-amplification step. Um, but this, of course, included now reverse transcription, amplification, then forward transcription into RNA again, and then the measurement um, of, the, um, uh, of the viral RNA with Cas13A. And here to make it mobile, they combined it with a lateral flow assay, very similar to a pregnancy assay. So when we started these, um, you know, two years ago, we decided not to um, use preamplification. Um, because we also wanted to be, remain quantitative and want to really maintain the simplicity of the essay to make it a single step, potentially cheap essay that could be used in the field. But in order to keep, to maintain sensitivity, we did not choose to use the collateral flow, but we maintained the fluorescence outreach and um, opted for using a mobile phone camera as a, as a mobile plate reader. So in January, when the sequence of the then so-called Wuhan virus was published, um, we pivoted the essay to SARS-CoV-2, developed guide RNAs based on the sequence, um, and started to test very simply and with in vitro transcribed RNAs whether we would be able to detect um, SARS-CoV-2 RNA in samples. And uh, this is just literally the first set of guides measured here in a robotic protocol, where you see that um, over an time of uh, uh, two hours, the signal, the fluorescent signal is being acquired. And we do this in the presence of the viral target or in the absence of the viral target or the so-called RNP alone. And you can see that there's different uh, guide RNAs that are functioning very well, and there are some that are functioning very poorly. And so when we focused on two that performed very well and performed another limit of detection study similar to what Jennifer had done in 2016, we hit the same threshold of about 100,000 copies per microliter, below which we could not um, really reliably call a sample positive or negative. And this was very reproducibly done with different, with different guide RNAs. However, the picture changed when we started to combine the guides. Um, then we could um, reproducibly shift um, the, the uh, limit of detection um, by about a hundred and even a thousand fold um, um, to a more sensitive state. So we could easily detect after two hours about a thousand copies per microliter, which is now in the range of what, what we need, um, even down to a hundred copies per microliter, albeit with a, a less confidence than with, with a thousand. This did not come at the cost of specificity. Um, here I'm showing you the, the direct readout from the plate reader for the single guides versus the double guide. And when we tested this against SARS-CoV-2, you see the same result as shown before. Against MERS RNA, however, we did not get any signal. And we also did not get any cross-reactivity with any cellular RNA that we extracted out of a lung carcinoma cell line here. But of course, this is all done with um, in vitro transcribed RNA or viral RNA from supernatant from infected cells that we grow in our BSL-3 facility. Uh, but the important part was really to show that there were um, that they also functioned with real positive patient samples, nasal swabs that we obtained from our collaborators at the BioHub here in San Francisco. They gave us five in a different range of viral loads, and you can see that we could confidently uh, call all these five positive um, over the, the, RN, the negative swab or the RNP control alone. So while this was very encouraging, I think it's all done in the plate reader um, in the same way that I have shown you at the beginning. Um, and we, but we wanted to do this on a, on a portable um, platform with a mobile phone because we wanted to continue to use fluorescence. 
we, we think that this is a more sensitive way than lateral flow. I think the mobile phone is portable. It's definitely trackable because with a GPS system, you can immediately also um, you know, find the location of a per person who is positive or negative. Um, and most importantly, at the time of a pandemic, is that it's existing and widely available. So we did not have to build it um, and, and, and wait for parts and, um, and other in, in, in ingredients. Now, Dan really pioneered this um, in, 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 uh, with respect to mobile phone microscopy very early when the first Nokia phone with a, with a camera was developed and, um, and started with the students in Berkeley to build these cell scopes that allowed magnification um, um, of uh, biological specimens um, through, the, uh, through the camera. But we all know that we, there's a long way from um, we've come a long way from the initial Nokia phones to um, now the iPhones or other mobile phones that we have everywhere where the quality of the camera has rapidly improved and now allows, you know, the blowing up of a picture taken with a, with a mobile phone um, on a big billboard um, towering over the highway in San Francisco here. And so you can, with a cell scope, you can take pretty pictures of little aquatic animals in the Hawaiian ocean, or you can use it as a medical device um, in Cameroon um, to detect lower, 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 lower microfilaria in the blood of people directly in the field where this blood sample is inserted into this um, cell scope. Um, instrument and, uh, and within minutes the, the camera can decide whether there is a presence of the worm based on its movement or, or, or not and that initiates then immediate therapy and the savior of many eyesights uh, in these regions and that's ongoing currently in Africa. So what we did is we transferred the cell, phone, cell scope um, technology to a mini plate reader format where we combined the, 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 um, the, the cell phone with a laser and also needed to decide, um, needed to find out whether, you know, the acquisition of the signal over time would be steady and sensitive enough. And if, if I say we, it's mainly the very talented people in Dan Fletcher's group. And you can see here in these very early recordings that within 30 minutes or even within five minutes, we could call um, samples positive, um, you know, uh, slightly positive here with a single guide or very positive with a double guide reproducing um, exactly the same essay that I have shown you before on the plate reader. And the whole time we thought that we needed to achieve the same sensitivity that the plate reader had and that basically the plate reader was the benchmark for the mobile phone to reach. It turned out that it's exactly the opposite, that the mobile phone camera here, the Google Pixel 4 camera quality is much better than the plate reader optics. And this is shown here in the way that the signals are being acquired over time where you see that there's a much more steady acquisition while a, versus a much more noisy acquisition over time um, with a plate reader which takes much longer to confidently call a signal positive or negative. And so we have moved now to our prototype 2 device which is mobile, similar to the box that is being used in, in Cameroon. Um, uses the mobile phone mounted on top and has a laser inside and then and the sample is basically loaded from the side. Um, and these are patient samples, highly positive, slightly positive and negative that we within minutes we can, uh, the, the, the associated software can with high confidence call positive and negative. And so when we compare the two hour plate reader patient samples with the 30 minute um, pixel four readings, we can in a much accelerated manner call these uh, samples um, confidently positive, even more confidently than with the plate reader in, in a shorter time. And I say 30 minutes, but we can actually um, call these after five minutes positive with a 95% confidence. So the conclusion is that direct detection of SARS-CoV-2 RNA with a mobile phone is possible. There's a rapid turnaround of results. We are now down to five to 30 minutes, uh, depending on the um, um, viral load. Um, sensitivity is in the range of detection for spreaders and the range of um, uh, 100 to 1,000 copies per microliter. 
And this is just the beginning because we see many possibilities for improvement because currently we're only combining two guides or maximally three, but we have uh, you know, um, uh, endless possibilities in the, um, in the genome of um, SARS-CoV-2. So with this, I end. Thank you very much for your attention. I thank a lot of people who have helped us enormously in the first few months to accelerate this um, in an unprecedented manner. But three people really stand out who I have to thank, which is Parinas Trizuni in my lab, MD, PhD student, extremely talented, who started the whole process and have, has pulled it through um, the whole SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, development. She works closely together with Maria Diaz, a student of bioengineering in Berkeley, and Sun Min Son, um, senior postdoc in Dan's lab, both extremely talented, um, who have really helped with building the device and building the software. We thank all our funders, especially the NIH Radex program, for their, their support. Thank you again, and I'm happy to take any questions.